Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here speaking at this symposium. I came when Jeff told me he was not going to come in spite of my telling him how <coughs> much he would appreciate it and how much fun he would have here. But Jeff doesn't go anywhere anymore after Stockholm. So I want to tell you a little bit about what it's like growing up in this tradition uh, as the F1 in, in what I consider to be a very revered and, and honorable lineage. Jeff had his training under Larry in this department. And needless to say, the folklore of the department was a part of my daily experience as a graduate student, as Jeff tried in all of his dealings with students and in science to emulate Larry as much as possible. And one of the first things we learned when we got to his lab in the, in the Friday morning lab meetings we would have, which consisted of students being told to get up to the blackboard and diagram various kinds of crosses, such as adjacent one and adjacent two. And you had to do it, and you had to be prepared to do it, um, or you would be uh, subject to the very cold shoulder of Jeff Hall. But as you see here, it is, a, it is a revered lineage and one that we all were very proud to be part of and, and are. Um, and this was the Jeff Hall that I first met. Because Jeff turns out, I knew Jeff even before I was a graduate student. Jeff and my brother were roommates in college, at Amherst College, uh, in, the in the early 1960s. And my first memories of Jeff are of him being, he, w he visited us at our home outside of Philadelphia. But in addition, I would go up and visit my brother at college during uh, holidays at school. And I remember very clearly Jeff drunk, face down on the floor of their suite in a very characteristic pose. Um, so this was Jeff in his college yearbook picture. And this is Jeff as a, as a graduate student at UW, where he participated in anti-war protests. And I, know, and I saw this poster in Jeff's garage in Bethesda of his family's home when I visited him there once in 1990. And one of the traditions that we all were uh, immersed in was the idea of the importance of formal genetics. And one of the famous stories regarding that was apparently in the studies of the, of the maternal effect mutant daughterless, Larry was alleged to have made the comment when he heard that it was a maternal effect mutation and therefore had to do with a substance in the egg, his comment was, the only time I care about a substance in the egg is when I sit down to breakfast. <laughs> and that became a kind of a mantra for us in, in what was kind of a general disdain for biochemistry, referred to often as going down the biochemical drain. <laughs> And, and if it was a genetic and it was Drosophila, as you've heard previously, that was considered to be the pinnacle of science. Jeff went from, from UW to be a postdoc in Seymour Benzer's lab, where, as you've heard, he was one of at least two who had come from hardcore fly labs to help bring some real genetics to Seymour's lab, which was studying Drosophila but where he was not experienced in Drosophila genetics other than what he was able to pick up from Ed Lewis, his friend who, who had a lab down the hall, and uh, which was not insubstantial. But um, <laughs> it wasn't how Seymour liked to spend his time. Seymour liked to spend his time pushing flies and doing experiments. So, and this was the Benzer lab that Jeff was part of in 1972. A motley crew, if ever there was one, with the likes of Bill Harris, Chip Quinn, who went on to study learning and memory, Doug Kankel, 
who Jeff worked with extensively, who became a developmental biologist. Here's Jeff, Seymour, and, I, and I'm not sure, this was a, somebody who was a graduate student whose name I don't know, and the others were technicians in the lab at the time. And one of Jeff's friends at Caltech was Bill Gelbart, who was a postdoc in Ed Lewis's lab, and who was studying uh, various kinds of mutations that would produce mosaics, one of which was a, a mutant called mitotic loss inducer that became part of our armamentarium of different, of the 25 different ways of producing genetic mosaics, because that became a major activity in Jeff's lab, to ways to induce them and ways to analyze them. And uh, Sturdivant had begun doing this um, kind of analysis initially with just with visible markers in, in genander morphs produced by unstable ring X loss, which he, he was doing with his postdoc at the time, Antonio Garcia Bolito. And they were doing fate mapping uh, in Seymour's. They began with Seymour. Seymour saw a way of using this technique to fate map where the behaviors would map to uh, in these genandromorphs by looking at the, not at sort of the analog of the recombination distance, in this instance being the probability of a mosaic dividing line falling between your marker and the phenotype you were studying. And from this, they could infer where on the blastoderm, which was what the fate map uh, revealed, the nervous system would turn out to be, uh, and, the, and that mapping was later confirmed when Jeff and Doug Kankel developed uh, an internal cellular marker for mosaicism with the enzyme mutant acid phosphatase. But the early work was all, which was started by Yoshiki Hata in Jeff, in, in Seymour's lab, was all done just with external uh, markers on the cuticle. And Seymour, being the impish humor, with his impish humor, dubbed, th th he defined that there were different ways that you could define what they called a behavioral focus, which was the name given to the point on the blastoderm that the behavior mapped to. And Seymour realized that you could have cases where it had to be mutant on either one side or the other, which he dubbed a domineering focus, or mutant on both sides, which he dubbed a submissive focus. And we later on learned, knowing more about Seymour, what, what, why, why he used those terms for it. Seymour had, well, shall we say, an off-color sense of humor. He might have looked like a benign deli, deli, somebody from behind the counter at a delicatessen, but he had a decidedly dark side. This is a poster that people in his lab cooked up at one point. And in keeping with that notion of what, Jeff, of what Seymour was like, he also attended, with, with his daughter visiting from college, much of the Charlie Manson trial in Los Angeles, because this was the kind of thing that Seymour was utterly fascinated by, human behavior in all of its manifestations in all organisms. So that was the origin of the terms domineering and submissive. Jeff was always using this slide from the movie The Fly to illustrate the importance of having an internal marker when you studied mosaics. <laughs> so you could tell what was the tissue focus of the, of, the, of the defect. And in this movie The Fly, you could see that uh, it, it, externally it looked like a fly, uh, but it wasn't behaving like, and it only, and it behaved inconsistently, some of the time like a fly, some of the time like a person. And that was the reason for De Jeff and Doug, Doug the histochemist, Jeff the geneticist, developing this mosaic technique using a duplication for the enzyme acid phosphatase, which would stain the cell bodies in the brain and, and making, syn Jeff synthesizing a duplication of this onto the X chromosome so that they could produce X chromosome loss genandromorphs by any of the available techniques for doing that with um, 
in chromosomes other than the ring X. And that mainly consisted in this initial study of theirs using the mutation referred to earlier today, paternal loss, the PAL mutation. And my familiarity with PAL is as a way of producing mosaics because it would produce random mitotic loss of male-derived chromosomes. So if you had a chromosome coming from the male that, that carried this duplication and the male was homozygous for PAL, you would get mosaics at a frustratingly low rate of something like you know, less, much less than 1%. When I, I, I spent two years trying to plow through the genetic crosses to produce the stocks to make PAL-induced mosaics with, the, with a gene coding for acetylcholinesterase in the fly. Never succeeded, only was able eventually to do it when I reverted to using the mitotic loss inducer mutation, which being X-linked and, and recessive was a little bit easier to get through the crosses with. And that finally made it possible for me to generate mosaics for acetylcholinesterase. But as you've heard, Larry, and this was transmitted through Jeff to me, Larry was a, a maestro of chromosome mechanic manipulation. And we all, on the Friday morning lab meetings where we were forced to get up in front of the group and diagram the crosses, would, would, would go through what was adjacent one or adjacent two segregation for, of translocation uh, breakpoints. And this was part of our upbringing. So Jeff used this ability to make mosaics with PAL for the acid phosphatase duplication uh, to generate the first fate map of the nervous system in the fly using the acid phosphatase internal marker. This was the crossing scheme required to get those mosaics. And so it was a version of this scheme that I tried and failed twice to get through to make acetylcholinesterase uh, mosaics. Can I show that to my students? By all means. I'll be happy to send it to you. It took, well, I, I, it took me a while to dig it up out of my, um, I realized it was actually in one of their papers. Uh, and that's where I finally got that figure from. But before that, I had to try to dig it up out of my lecture notes from those famous Friday morning lab meetings. This was the other aspect of making of analyzing genetic mosaics in the nervous system, that you had to take the fly that was externally mosaic for the visible marker, test it for the behavior you were studying, recover it, embed it in this uh, OCT medium, cut serial sections of it on the cryostat, and recover enough of them to be able to see the entire brain pattern of mosaicism. Needless to say, the number of flies that you could successfully carry through this entire procedure was not many. And if you were starting with a low frequency of mosaics to begin with, it would be a long haul, as it was for me, but one that I eventually did get through. And this, this is what the acid phosphatase mosaic looked like in the brain. This is an example of a male, of, of a, of a, a male, a male fe a genandromorph which is male on this side, female on that side in the, in the brain tissue. So Jeff asked the question, what parts of the brain need to be male for the fly to act like it's a male? And he did this sort of fate mapping study of it using this internal marker. And what he found was that, not, not surprisingly, it mapped to the brain and that the, and that the different stages of courtship mapped to different parts of the nervous system that the first several steps of orienting, tapping, and following would tend to go together and require male tissue on either one side or the other of this part of the dorsal brain, <coughs> that the later stage called licking, in which the male uh, extends his proboscis and licks the female genitals, that maps to a part of the brain somewhat more ventral to that, uh, but it has to be male on both sides for that to occur. And the later stages, including wing extension, I'm sorry, not wing extension, but the courtship song um, and attempted copulation and copulation require male tissue in the thoracic ganglion on both sides uh, 
for uh, attempted copulation, but only on one side or the other for the courtship song. And you could produce mosaics that would sing on one side, uh, not on the other, in the presence of a virgin female. This is a characteristic picture of Jeff and his dachshund meatball, whom those of you who knew Jeff back then will remember, because he was an ever present, he was ever present in the lab along with his sister, Samantha. Jeff would always cry out loudly, Sam and meat, time to eat. And these two little dachshunds would come in, scurrying in from wherever they were uh, out in the lab. And he would feed them. And then he would take them to the stairway. And they would clatter their way down the stairs with their collars jingling. And he would take them outside for a walk. During this period, uh, to analyze these mosaics, Jeff also collaborated with uh, a scientist he had met um, at a fly meeting named Florian von Schulcher, who had been in Aubrey Manny's lab and had gone back to a job at Munich where he started a lab. And he was studying a courtship song in the fly and wanted to do a mosaic study of it with these genandromorphs. And he uh, could, was, cap was able to record courtship song of the fly using a sort of a super sensitive little tiny microphone. And from that, he was able to get these sorts of recordings of the, of the song of the fly, which consists of a kind of a whine called the sign song or a Morse code-like uh, punctuated thing uh, of pulses. And that the, it was known that flies produced this, these pulses. And the initial literature stated that there was a 35 millisecond interval between pulses. But none of them had ever looked at very many, at, at very long traces to see how consistent that interval was. Jeff, being the thorough scientist that he was, looked at it um, and saw that it was actually variable and in an interesting way. It showed a sinusoidal oscillation, which his postdoc, who came to the lab then, Bambos Kiriakou, picked up on. And initially, he was going to use it to analyze the circuitry of it using the acetylcholinesterase mutations that I had been studying as a graduate student. This is Bambos. This is the, the, the tiny microphone that he used for fly courtship song. This is Jeff during that period when he was frequently clowning around in the lab. And yes, he looked at a much longer series of traces than had ever been looked at before. Uh, stretching the chart paper all through the hallway, which I'm sure Gary Carpin remembers. Gary was an undergraduate in the lab at the time. And um, he would measure the interval between them one by one with a little tiny ruler and plot them on, a, on, on graph paper. And when he did that, he saw that not only did it oscillate, but it oscillated in a sinusoidal fashion. And that the interval could be considerably greater than what had been reported before that because it was oscillating over a much wider range than just what had been that reported and recorded. By this time, Ron Kanopka had already been a student in Seymour's lab and had published the first circadian rhythm mutants, which was published back in 1971. And Jeff knew Ron because they overlapped some, some of the time uh, while Je well, uh, when Jeff came to the lab, Ron had not left yet. And so Jeff knew and had kept track of Ron when he had gone and gotten a job after Caltech, where he didn't get tenure, to go to this little college in upstate New York called Clarkson, uh, where he had a little laboratory. They didn't want him to do research. He just did it anyway on his own. He had a little closet in his lab where he set up his fly activity recording, homemade activity recording device for recording circadian rhythms. And so when Jeff, Jeff knew of, the, of Kanopka's mutants, the long day, short day, and arrhythmic circadian mutants, and Jeff suggested that Bambos look at whether those mutants affected the oscillation in the courtship song. And sure enough, they did. That 
the long day mutant had a long, longer oscillation cycle period. The, the, the short day mutant had a shorter period, and the arrhythmic fly had no discernible oscillation at all. This then became part of a multi-year footnote war over whether or not this oscillation in courtship song actually existed. And Jeff fought this battle for many years with them, and, it was, and it's not over yet because more recently, uh, a guy at Genelia Farm claimed to have disproven the presence of this oscillation. And it all comes down to how you analyze the song rhythms that you record and whether or not you just apply uh, a blanket criterion um, program to it as the guy at Genalia did or whether you exert a certain amount of, of uh, selection of those records that you think are actually good records as opposed to uh, sloppy ones. So this gave rise then to their paper on the circadian rhythm mutants affecting the fluctuation in the courtship song. It was around this time, during their daily basketball games, intramural basketball games at the gym, where Jeff had become very good friends with Michael Rossbash, who was an assistant professor at the same time as Jeff. They started together, they were basketball buddies, and in the locker room they would get together and talk about what they were actually doing in their labs. And Jeff told Michael about this. Michael had been looking for a suitable gene to clone, one that you could have a null mutation in and would be viable, but one that had a phenotype that was also going to be interesting. And the period mutations that Jeff told him about fit those criteria. So here's uh, Jeff with Michael, one of the lab parties. And as you heard, the rest is history. This collaboration eventually resulted in truly groundbreaking research in the mechanism of circadian rhythms for which Jeff and Michael, along with Mike Young from Rockefeller, who had been their competitor, all three were honored in 2017 for the, with the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. Richly deserved, if ever there was one. But as I said, the the, the battle was intense for many years, beginning with these different groups in Australia and in England. And part of, the di part of the problem was that the male fly doesn't sing continuously. He stops for a while, and then he starts up again. And if you assume that he's not keeping time, and you look for, the oscill for, for a sinusoidal oscillation, not taking into account that there was a gap temporal gap in the singing, you don't see it. But if you do take that into account, then they were able to show that there is an oscillation. So if you assume that the fly hums along to himself when he's not actually singing, then it works. And among the people to independently replicate this was a colleague of Jeff's named Dusty Dows at the University of Maine in Orono, who using a completely independent means of analyzing the song statistically came up with a, with a confirmation of their result. So this was the back then, the mid-60s mid was sort of the beginning of the modern era for what we've heard referred to as neurogenetics when Seymour entered the field. Previously, the field had consisted of people who were of a more evolutionary bent, such as Jerry Hirsch, who were interested in studying selected lines rather than mutated lines because they thought that mutated lines were too unnatural to be very informative. And this, this constituted another kind of pitched battle um, between schools of thought, between the mutant hunters, Benzer and his students, and those who believe, were interested in natural variance and evolution, Hirsch and his students, for example. And Seymour's opening salvo in this was his 1967 paper on the phototaxis mutants isolated through this device that he invented and loved to play with called the counter, counter current fractionating device uh, modeled after the chemical counter current separation technique. And Ron Kanapka 
came to the lab as the first graduate student back then and isolated the, the, this was the circadian rhythm that he studied, which was not activity patterns, but eclosion from the pupa case, where the fly would normally eclose even in, as, as in the definition of a circadian rhythm, meaning they continue the rhythm even in constant conditions, i.e. constant darkness, that the fly culture, which was placed into constant darkness, they would still emerge at the same time every day. And this is the, sh the short day mutant emergent cycle and the long day mutant emergent cycle. And this is the arrhythmic flies, where it's not even because you get more flies coming out after a few days that, that eggs had been laid rather than uh, uh, all at once. At this point, Seymour was telling Max Delbrook at Caltech about this new result one day with great excitement about having found these mutants in the circadian rhythm. And Delbrook didn't believe it was possible, so he said, it's impossible, it can't be true. And Seymour said, but I have the mutants. And Delbrook insisted that it couldn't be true. The first of many, of, of what turned out to be many examples in, in fly behavior of things that, that are true and nobody believed at the time could possibly be true. And another of the mutants that Jeff studied early on, which he then went and spent a good half of his lab pursuing for years after that, was the fruitless mutation in which males would court other males. Uh, it's a recessive mutation. It was initially called fruity, and at a certain point, Seymour began getting uh, complaints from people that that was a, uh, an inappropriate name nowadays, so, he, so he, he altered it to fruitless. All of this begged the larger question of how do genes actually affect behavior? And part, a related aspect of that, which the kinds of studies he did and we did related to, is how can you study brain-wide functions at all? And it turns out that the mosaic techniques that we had already been using in the lab were one way of doing that, um, because you were looking at not focusing on a specific part of the brain, but looking in a kind of a forward genetic spirit of unbiased asking for where in the fly brain does a mutation have to be uh, expressed, does have to be acting in order to produce a given phenotype. And this was based on the Janandrapurf technique that had been known for decades in the fruit fly among the cognoscenti. And when I came to Jeff's lab, my project became making mosaics with an internal marker in the nervous system affecting behavior. And my project was to work initially with the acetylcholinesterase mutation, a recessive lethal affecting the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, which we knew was required for viability. It was a recessive lethal in the fly. And Jeff had isolated other alleles of it and found that certain intraallelic combinations would give you a temperature sensitive phenotype. But I made mosaics with it for a null mutation. And amazingly, some of them survived with fairly large portions of the brain mutant, leading us to believe that the fly might not need much of its brain uh, to survive. Um, a milder version of what later turned, to be, turned out to be true in studying the origins of male courtship behavior in the fly brain, where it turns out that it requires very little brain tissue uh, for a male to want to court a female, a finding that no female I've ever met finds surprising. <laughs> but this was the acetylcholinesterase uh, mutation. The other aspect of my thesis was using the segmental aneuploidy technique to localize and obtain and then screen for mutants in the enzyme that makes acetylcholine, choline acetyltransferase. So this idea of studying brain-wide functions stayed with me. And in recent years, as the technology has improved for doing recordings from the entire fly brain all at once, particularly using this techno technique called light field microscopy, which allows you to see down through the translucent fly brain all of the levels at once 
So if you have a fluorescent marker of neuronal activity, uh, such as a voltage reporter or even or a calcium reporter, you can actually record entire brain-wide patterns of activity uh, in the fly as it's behaving um, if you set up your microscope uh, appropriately to do that. So we have been doing that now for various behaviors in the fly. These are some of our first recordings that we published earlier, uh, late last year, uh, showing sort of activity. And what we find is that there are, as, as not surprisingly, there are many aspects of what the fly does that involve waves of activity going through the brain, uh, and we're a long way from understanding them, and we will have a lot to look at and understand of that in the future.